Hi, I'm Irving. Welcome to Secrets of Irving. I mean, Isis. Oh, mighty Isis. Shazam! was a good enough Saturday morning hit to warrant a spin-off of sorts, though in good Saturday morning fashion we don't get any real explanation, we just jump into it. This wasn't billed as a separate show, but as the second part of the Shazam! Isis Hour. On September 6, 1975, audiences got their first introduction to the new format and the new character. Oh my queen, said the royal sorcerer to Hatshepsut, with this amulet, you and your descendants are endowed by the goddess Isis. How it works, where it comes from, why it only works for you and your descendants, you ask too many questions, my queen. With the powers of the animals and the elements, you will soar as the falcon soars, run with the speed of gazelles, and command the elements of sky and earth. What I could find about the actual Egyptian deity didn't say a whole lot about commanding animals, flying, and controlling the elements. Mainly, she was part of the Osiris myth, the story of his death and raising, since she was his wife and she brought him back. As time went on, she seems to have absorbed a lot of abilities from other Greek and Egyptian deities until she was this slumgullion of different things, and it's a good thing she was a goddess, because she'd have to be to keep it all straight. In this mythology, her powers are fairly limited. Though being able to control the elements is a handy power to have, just ask the people who control the weather on Earth in Star Trek. 3,000 years later, a young science teacher dug up this lost treasure and found she was heir to the secrets of Isis. What an amazing happenstance that she's a descendant of Hatshepsut. But since it's been 3,000 years, genetics being what they are, you could probably walk down a road in Cairo and throw a rock and hit one of her distant relatives. And so, unknown to even her closest friends, Rick Mason and Cindy Lee, she became a dual person, Andrea Thomas, teacher. Oh, mighty Isis. And Isis, dedicated foe of evil, defender of the weak, champion of truth and justice. As we begin today, Andrea's friend Cindy is explaining how she and her companion saw a UFO and got pictures. Up to now I've been an unbeliever, but these pictures are hard to ignore. A lot of respected people have seen UFOs. Scientists, pilots, and other well-trained observers. Andrea, flying saucers are myths and illusions. Oh, sure, people have seen them, but no one's ever caught one. Nobody said flying saucer. UFO means unidentified flying object. It could be flying saucers, or they could have interrupted a practice session of the synchronized frisbee throwing club. But we also have stories of people disappearing in a mysterious manner. A camper and a tourist vanished, and near each place they found a big round burn spot. I admit I'm curious, but there just couldn't be any connection. Maybe, maybe not. But I think the sheriff of Mountain Park should see these photographs. That's why I want the two of you to drive Cindy up there. That plus my own natural curiosity. Cindy is apparently too young to drive. But why does it require both of them? Because if we leave Rick behind, Brian Cutler won't get paid for this episode. So off they go. Cindy grabs a few things and buys more film for her camera. Mountain Park is a wide place in the road up in the mountains above wherever we are. All we've got is one deserted cabin, one abandoned car, and two round burn spots. Beyond that, well, thank you for letting me look at your pictures, even if I still don't believe in UFOs. My sentiments exactly. I understand some of the people here are connecting the UFOs and the disappearances. Well, we don't really know whether anybody's disappeared or whether they just went home. There haven't been any missing persons reports that we know of, and the evidence is sketchy. But the sheriff is still concerned. Do me a favor. Don't show those pictures around. People here are scared enough as it is. Scared? What about? Uh, some of them feel that uh, they may be next. A few people from Mystery Mountain are talking about selling out and moving. Andrea wants to check out the cabin and do some chemical tests on the burn spots. Cindy just spotted a couple of friends. Hi, guys. I was hoping I'd run into you two. What's happened lately? Well, nobody else has disappeared yet. Yeah, but Art and I think it's only a matter of time. Uh, Cindy, what do you got there? Look in here. I got some good pictures of the UFOs. These guys are in it up to their necks. The only question is how and why. Uh, Cindy, these pictures, they're really UFOs? Cindy, let's go. Okay, Andrea, just a second. Well, I have to go now. We're looking into this UFO deal. See you later. 
And now they have a problem. Whatever they're doing, they don't need any concrete evidence of it. Let's go. Mr. Moss will want to know about this. Yep. They're working for a moth? Oh, he said Moss. Whoever that is. A fellow named Pratt rented it for all summer. Jenkins came up and he found the place in a mess, like maybe there'd been a struggle or something. Then Pratt was gone. Car sick. Car sick. That's me. Excuse me. If it was, let's hope it doesn't come back. Gosh. We got another abandoned car up on the highway just like the other one. I'm gonna have to go there right now. The car is running, there's no driver anywhere, and there's another big burn spot by the car. And that's not all. I've heard that sound before. The UFOs, they're coming. Because a UFO is the only thing that could be making that noise, with the possible exception of any of the many synthesizers that were already being made by this time. I don't believe it, but, but they're real. Let's get to higher ground. How solid do they look, folks? Can you see metal or some other distinct material? Because they look really ethereal to me. They start up a hill, but Cindy forgot her camera. She'll go back for it and join them. While she's at the car changing film, she hears that noise again. Where's Cindy? Well, that's right, she went back to get her camera. It shouldn't have taken this long. We're not going to see anything more up here now anyway. How about I go call in? Guess what they'll find when they get back to the car. Rick! Cindy. Cut to Cindy in the spaceship. In the 70s, all UFO parts were made in Detroit. Boy, am I glad you guys came by when you did. I heard the UFOs coming. You're lifesavers. Yeah, we're real heroes. Cindy gets out to go look for the UFOs some more. Wait, she just said they were coming back and these guys rescued her. Now she's going to look for them again? Does she have any idea what she's doing? She leaves the pictures with her friends and that sparks the discussion. They're both getting really uncomfortable. All we have to do is swipe the pictures and take Cindy back to town. No, nobody's getting hurt. Yeah. I know. I don't like the whole thing either. Cindy has no idea, of course. She met these guys the last time she was here with a hiking group. They were the leaders. As far as she knows, they're okay. And they're having a hard time betraying her innocence, which suggests to me that they are okay, but they've somehow gotten themselves into something that's biting them in the butt. Think very carefully before you make any major decisions, young gentlemen. Andrea and the sheriff decide to search the road in case she's walking somewhere. The deputy will head back toward town while the rest of them continue this way, which is the way those guys took her. While Cindy is looking around and the boys are examining the pictures, someone else comes along. Better boys have a little trouble? No, Mr. Moss, no trouble at all. In case digital is all you've ever known, and trust me, I'm a big fan of digital, when a camera took a picture on film, it came out negative with all the colors and black and white reversed. To get a normal picture, you put the negative into an enlarger, which is basically a projector, and projected the image onto photosensitive paper. If you needed to get rid of a picture completely, you had to destroy the negative too, because if someone had that, they could make as many copies of the picture as they wanted. Hence, Mr. Moss's consternation. He says, I'll have to get the negatives myself. And the way he says it leaves no doubt that he doesn't care how. Uh, li listen, I just passed the sheriff back on the road with a few people. Get it, get it. and Gee, they seem terribly upset. Oh, those are my friends. Well, uh, the boys here are just about out of gas, and uh, I'm going back that way. No, right Cindy, back. don't go with him. What's the matter? Look, Mr. Moss, we're, we're wrong to get involved with you. I mean, we both know that. At first, it was fun. But you're not getting Cindy involved. As I thought, they're decent guys who got into something over their heads. Moss tries to make a move for Cindy, and the one behind the wheel starts the car and takes off. Moss follows them, but they're in luck. Hey! 
They're in luck because Moss is stupid enough to sit there and watch while they spill the whole story to the sheriff and point the finger at him. Then it occurs to him to scamper on out of there. Everybody jumps in cars and goes after him, somehow leaving Andrea standing alone by the side of the road. Oh, mighty ice, ice, ice. Isis's first words are ones we'll hear a lot. O Zephyr winds which blow on high, lift me now so I can fly. Where Captain Marvel appears to have some special flying ability, Isis rides the wind currents like a raptor. And where Billy Batson becomes an entirely different person when he transforms, Andrea Thomas changes her clothes. We get an extended flying sequence with cut-ins of the cars chasing each other. Then she sets down on the road a ways ahead of Moss. Oh, sun that changes day from night, help me stop this man from flight. She called on the power of the sun to make his car overheat. Isn't that a bit like shooting houseflies with a 12-gauge? While Moss is studying his car, he looks up and sees a UFO. After the day he's having, he shouldn't be surprised. Isis lands and goes after him. It took them over half an hour to catch up. You can tell because Moss's car isn't steaming anymore. That's why I don't run. I'm built too much like he is. Mr. Moss, perhaps you need a dose of your own medicine. Ancient Sphinx, all-knowing and wise, confront this man with his own lies. He starts hallucinating the same UFOs he showed the boys how to create with some projectors and sound equipment. Suddenly, he's a believer. Sheriff, look after this man. He claims he saw a UFO. The sheriff takes Moss up to the road where the rest are waiting, including Isis. We use these things to create the UFO hoax, and Mr. Moss gave me the cars to leave on the side of the road. They thought it was just an elaborate prank to liven up a sleepy town. Jules and Goldor. On the way back, Moss told us he found a new vein of gold running through a lot of people's property. Well, we didn't know that. He never told us. Yeah, I know. He told us that on the way back, too. His idea was to scare those people into selling their homes and moving away to escape the little green men. The truly frightening part is... A few people from Mystery Mountain are talking about selling out and moving. It was about to work. Where's Andrea? I left her on the road. Wait till I tell her what happened. Oh, Zephyr winds which blow on high, lift me now so I can fly. Yeah, I better have them lift you back there so those guys can find Andrea back where they stranded her. It was fantastic. Isis was there and you should have seen her. You know something? How come you're never around when Isis is there? We're starting right in asking that question. Could get interesting if we follow up on it. Beats me. Seems as if you and Rick are always having all the fun. It's probably just as well. There was a lot going on and the excitement might have gotten to you. You're right, Rick. At times like that, it's well that a woman isn't there to get in the way. I wonder if Rick has any idea what he just said, because I get the feeling he wasn't listening to himself. And while we're on the subject of Rick, who is he? Another teacher? Casual friend? Secret boy toy? And is Cindy a student or what? Sometimes she talks like one, but neither Andrea nor Rick treats her like one. They act like she's a colleague. Who are these people? The intro tells us they're her friends, and that's it. Those are the credentials that allow the three of them free reign in an investigation of this type. I hope we get more information as we go along, because that's giving me trouble. The other thing that's giving me trouble is Isis herself. She doesn't do anything. She flies from point A to point B and recites an incantation. No real interaction with the people or the situation. No action to speak of. Her job is to wear the skimpy outfit and call on everything to do the work for her. But just like Shazam, she's not the focus of the show. The main characters in this story are Art and Chick, the two guys in the car. 
As I said, they're basically decent guys who got involved in what they thought was just a youthful prank. And when they realized they were over their heads and people could get hurt, they did the right thing. They knew they would face consequences for their part, but they did right anyway. ISIS was a vehicle toward resolving the whole thing, nothing more. Really, the hero of this one is Cindy. Just her presence and niceness was enough to make these guys change their minds when they realized she might get hurt. It's another interesting spin on a superhero story. The ISIS character is there to draw the viewer to the show so we can hit them with the story. My problem right now is, at least when Captain Marvel shows up, he does something on the screen. I can't say that much for ISIS. But she did a good job of getting the lessons across. Do the right thing, even when it hurts. Oh, and this. Why, Mr. Moss, there are no such things as UFOs. I'm Irving, and I'll see you next time.